Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth? That's a haunting question. Looking for clarity in our Christian lives. The text to which I would point you this morning is found in verse 9, chapter 1, book of Colossians. And so from the day we heard, we have not ceased to pray for you, asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will. In my life, most often when I think about knowing God's will and doing God's will, I'm pretty sure I think too small. I'm pretty sure that I think of God's will as coming into play just when I want to know what step to take that'll make me the happiest or what decision I need to make that will make me prosper. Still searching for that one. Or what is it I need to do or where where do I need to align my life so that other folks will like me and accept me. In other words, I think too often of the will of God as though it were designed for me so that I could get what I want through the back door. I mean, maybe maybe some of you are like that. You really don't think about the, the will of God until there's something big going on. You know, what house to, to buy? Well, we don't worry about that one too much sometimes. <laughs> you know, what car, what college to go to, whom to marry, you know, what steps to take, take the promotion, take the job change. You know, there we say, well, I want to know the will of God. But otherwise than that, we, we sort of just sort of uh, coast through life. Don't think that much about the will of God. But Paul said to these Colossian saints, he said, I am praying earnestly because I know the gospel has come into your life. It's had had a, a major impact. It's bearing fruit. It's increasing in your life. And so my prayer for you is that you would know his will. You would know the will of God with spiritual wisdom and understanding that you would have a discernment about the will of God in your life. So this morning I want to suggest to you that A life focused on the will of God will give you clarity in how you live and what you do and what you think. I want to give you two examples of of how the will of God operates in human life. Two examples. The first one is Jesus Christ. Um, And no doubt uh, you, you may even have already gone to the Garden of Gethsemane in these past few moments talking about the will of God. And, and there Jesus in the garden, knowing that he was about to be arrested, prosecuted, scourged, beaten, and then crucified, knowing that, that the weight of this incredible physical suffering would have the weight of spiritual suffering because our sins would be upon him Knowing that that, all that was in front of him, he he prayed earnestly, you know, Father, if if it's at all possible, you know, if if you can pull it off, Father, (laughs) let this cup pass from me. We understand why he prayed that. You've probably prayed like that. You didn't pray it as well. Your prayer was something like, God, get me out of this. You know? So like the, 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 the guy who sows wild oats and then he prays for crop failure. You know? but, uh, but Jesus prayed, he said, remove this cup from me. That, what's about to happen? Said, if there was some way to get out of that. But then immediately after that, you remember what he prayed. He said, nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. Good King James. Not my will, thy will be done. Now, I'm going to confess to you, I I think for the major part of my life, I looked at that as though Jesus were somehow schizophrenic spiritually, 
that he had his will. I don't want to suffer. I don't want the cross. I don't want to do it. Don't, 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 don't. And then there was God's will. Yeah, you're going to the cross. You're going to suffer. You're going to die for the sins of lost humanity. And these two wills were somehow in conflict with each other. And so Jesus goes in front of the Father and he says, Father, I don't want to die for these folks. You don't know them the way I do. Father, let's, let's, just, let's just cancel the gig. I mean, let, let's be done with it. Remove the cup from me. But nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. You know you, how you pray that, sort of as a hedge of the bed. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. No. It's not as though the father and the son were, were arguing with each other. The father says, son, I want you to die for the sins of humanity. Jesus says, no, I really don't want to die for the sins of humanity. You're going to die for the sins of humanity. Why? I shouldn't have to die for the sins of humanity. I'm the father. You have to do what I tell you. Okay, dad, I'll die for the sins of humanity. The will of the Father and the will of the Son are one. Yes, Jesus, human nature, divine nature. And, and uh, if you want to know, there's a controversy about it in church history called the monothelite controversy. Um, I just like saying monothelite. <laughs> but the point is, when Jesus prayed, he was saying, Father, you know, we look at this thing. If there were another way, we'd do it. But there isn't. If it were possible, yeah, remove the cup from me. But, Father, it's not like we have two different wills going on here. Father, it's not like I have my will and your will. It's your will, Father, and that is my will. You understand that? There's a oneness in the will of the Father and the Son together. And it was the delight of Christ to do the will of his Father. He told his disciples, he said, I have come to do the will of him who sent me. He said, that's, that's what my life is about, is doing the will of the Father, fulfilling everything that the Father has designed and incorporated into his plan for, for the salvation of a lost humanity. He says, that's why I've come, to do the will of the Father. And so it wasn't as though this was something alien to Jesus. It's not as though he was in the garden praying and saying, Father, I don't know what your will is, but you know, maybe it's this, maybe it's that, you know, the way we pray. He was saying, Father, your will is to, is to save lost persons, and my part in that is to die, to shed my blood on their behalf. Father, not my will. Thy will be done. That's all that matters. And you have this oneness of the will of the Father and the will of the Son together. Take you to another spot in the life of Jesus. That, this is what motivated, this is what got him through his through, through, through ministry when he was in the wilderness and being tempted by Satan. And Satan came up to him and said, Jesus, I hear you're hungry. Yeah, that's right, I'm hungry. Fasting will do that. So, well, look, if you're the son of God, you know, if, you, if you're the, the, the fellow you think you are, why don't you turn these stones into bread? I mean, after all, Jesus, you've got hunger, don't you? Didn't God design you to have hunger? Doesn't God want you to be happy and satisfied? Weren't you made this way that if you have an appetite, it should be fed? Shouldn't you just take what's going on inside of you and make sure that life satisfies who, you know, what you want? Jesus, you're hungry. Satisfy the hunger. The appetite should rule here, Jesus, don't you think? Jesus said to him, Satan, we're not about food. We don't live by bread, not by bread alone. We're about the will of the Father, and we find that will in the Word of God, and so we don't live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. That's where my life is. It's about the will of the Father. And then Satan said, well, look, Jesus, how about this? How about if we go to the very tallest a part of the temple compound, and you jump. You know, because after all, the Word of God, you said, just said Word of God, the Word of God says the angels will attend to you. They will not allow your foot to be dashed against the stone. I mean, that will amaze people. I mean, t think about the mileage you could get off of that one. Because after all, Jesus, why make it hard on yourself? And Jesus said, Satan, it's not about my comfort is about the will of the Father. And you don't tempt the Lord your God. You don't test the Lord your God like that. 
You, you don't try to manipulate the Lord your God like that. You simply ask, what does God want out of your life? And you go ahead with it. So you don't tempt the Lord your God. Satan, the third time, he said, look, uh, let, let me show you something. Took him to high mountain. He said, Jesus, look, look at it. All the kingdoms of the earth, I can get them for you. Wholesale. Really? Yeah. I can get you all the kingdoms of the earth. All you need to do is bow down and worship me. Think how simple that is. I mean, look, you know, you don't have to go through this cross. You don't have to go through this dying thing and all that. You, you, can, you can have all the kingdoms. Jesus said, Satan, look, it's about who God is. And you worship him and you serve him, and that's it. So you see, in the life of Jesus, the will of the Father was the entire consuming vision that he had. Who God is, who the Father is, that, that's what drove Jesus, motivated Jesus, defined Jesus in perfect concert with the will of God. That's who Jesus is that's how he lived. That's his life. And so the first example of the will of God in human life comes from Jesus Christ. And it's, and it's a life in which there's great joy and satisfaction and commitment and, and just a, a latching on to the will of the Father and whatever God wants. That's what my life is all about. So that's the first example. Now the second example I want to give to you is the rest of the human race. Everybody else. Because the Scripture says that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And what is sin? Sin is rejecting God's will in your life. It's either an act of rebellion against God's will. He said, I want you to do this. No way, Father. I'm not going to do that. And, you know, that's fine for you. Other people, I'm going over here. No, I want you to do this. No, I'm not going to do that either. It's either act of rebellion against God's word or it is is sort of a passive indifference to what God has said. It's, it's just saying, God, I don't, I don't even care. Now, in that kind of attitude of passive indifference, you might stumble into doing the right things. You, know? you might actually stumble into being compassionate. You might stumble into being a steward. You might stumble into doing wise things in your life, and your life will be better because that's the way God has designed his creation. But by leaving God out and by being indifferent to him, you are sinning against him because the definition of sin is violating the will of God. That's what it means to be a sinner. And so having rejected God and we are sinners and we just leave him out and then we come to Christ, we become believers in Christ and we sort of go halfway. God, I will follow you wherever you take me as long as it doesn't hurt. You know, wherever love leads, I, I, I love that song, by the way, wherever love leads, as long as it doesn't lead me to love that guy over there, do you know what he did to me? I'll go where you want me to go, dear Lord, where mountain, plain, and sea, as long as it's not across the street where the neighbor is mad at me. I just made that up. <laughs> Genius in your midst. Okay. No. But we put, the first thing we do is we sort of put these limitations on it and say, God, I want to do your will as long as it's, you know, as long as I get right of, of first refusal on, on, on these kinds of things. Or, or we say, God, um, I want to do your will, but I can handle most things. I can handle the, the, the little things. God, when it's something really big, then I'll come and I'll ask you what you want. If it's something that really has me baffled, I'll, I'll ask your advice. But we're not as committed to the will of God, not the way Jesus was. And so Paul prays for these Colossian Christians. He says, I'm praying that you will know his will with spiritual wisdom and discernment. I'm praying that you will know the will of God. Now look, I, I believe God has a design and a will for your life, and I think it includes the minutest detail, and I'm going to agree with you, sometimes it's difficult to know exactly what God wants us to do. But when Paul says, I want you to know the will of God, there's some things we do know about the will of God. First of all, we know that God wants you to be a believer in Jesus Christ. Scripture says, God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. The Bible says that whosoever believeth, no, anybody who believes, 
shall not perish but have everlasting life. And so God's will for your life is that Jesus Christ would be your Lord and your Savior. And if you have not come to that point where you have asked Christ into your heart to be your Lord and Savior, to, to take up residence of sovereignty in your life, if you haven't come to that point yet, the rest of the discussion won't make much sense. Here's why. I want to do the will of God, but I want to have nothing to do with his will in Jesus Christ. Does that make sense? You go to the Father and say, Father, I want you to show me the will, but I hate your son. Father, I, I want you to bless me. I want you to open doors for me. I want you to guide me so I do the right thing, but I don't want anything to do with your son who died for me. Now, God, out of his grace, opens doors for us, and God, out of his mercy, you know, blesses us even when we're, we're in abject rebellion against him. I mean, God, God does all kinds of things to draw us unto himself. But look, how nonsensical is it to say, I want to know what, what the will of God is, but I don't want his son, Jesus Christ, because his will for your life is that you be a believer in Jesus Christ, that he be Lord of your life. So if you're in one of those situations in life right now where, where you're saying, well, I, I need to know God's will. I've got, the, I've, I've got a job offer. I don't know if to change jobs or not. You know, the, the health benefits and, and uh, retirement. I don't know about moving the family. You know, you, you, and you're struggling with one of those, those, those really um, uh, mind-boggling kinds of decisions. The first thing you better make sure is that you're a believer in Jesus Christ because the rest of it won't matter. You might accidentally make the so-called right choice, but if you don't have Jesus Christ, it won't matter. So the first thing to do is make sure you're a believer in Jesus Christ. God's will for your life is that you live a holy and devout life. Jesus said, be ye perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. The Old Testament version of that is, be ye holy as I am holy. That's what God said to Israel. God's design for your life is that you would live a holy life, reflecting the, the majesty of God, the righteousness of God, the holiness of God, that how you live, what you say, how you treat other people would all be reflective of who God is. That's God's will for your life. And so if you're looking for God's guidance, if you're looking to know God's will in a particular situation, look at, look at your life and say, am I living out the holiness of God in my life? You know, those things that I already know, am I, am I doing those things? Am I surrendered to those things? The Bible says I need to love folks. Am I loving them? The Bible says I need to be a good steward of my resources. Am I a steward? The Bible says that I need to be in fellowship with other believers. Am I in fellowship with other believers? You know, the Bible says all kinds of things about my life. As best I can, as much as I know, as the Holy Spirit reveals them to me, am I obedient to what God has given me already? And if you're in one of those situations, you know, um, and you're looking for you, how do I know the will of God? Make sure you're a believer. Look for any unconfessed sin in your life. And, and then look for um, the wisdom of God's word and the fellowship of God's people. Whenever God saves somebody, he saves them into the church. You know that, don't you? you know, read, read the New Testament. You'll find that with two exceptions that I can think of, everyone who was saved was saved into a church fellowship. The first one was the thief on the cross, and we'll give him a pass. The other was the Ethiopian eunuch, and I su suspect that he started a Bible study as soon as he got home. Okay. It's God's design that we forsake not the assembling of ourselves together, as is the custom of some, but that we, we gather and encourage one another. So in searching for God's will, it just makes sense that I would listen to God's people and ask their wisdom, their advice, their insight on things. You know, some people, not many, some people know more than I do. <laughs> and some think they do. <laughs> but you know, folks can give us insight into the Word of God and insight into our lives, and they can see things from angles that we cannot see and, and, and those kinds of things. So if you're looking for the will of God, make, make sure that you're in fellowship with the body of Christ and that you're getting that kind of input, the Holy Spirit speaking through them into your life in that way. And so there's things we know about the, the, the will of God. And his will is, is, is not divided. So if, if God's will is that you be a believer, be a believer. If God's will is that you live a, a life of holiness and righteousness, live a life of holiness. And if God's will is that you abide in, in the fellowship of God's people and you abide in his word, then abide in his word. Abide in the fellowship with God's people. 
And in that context, then, searching for the will of God um, makes more sense. Now, let us agree one with another that even going through all that, as best we can, we, you know, we, we, we've prayed as, as, as best we know how in the leadership of the Spirit. We're, we're, we're a believer, born-again believer in Christ, and, and we're seeking and striving to live that life of holiness. And as much as we know, all unconfessed sin has been brought before the Father. We've done all that, and we can still make a decision that seems to wind up in the wrong place. I say seem to because we don't know how God's working it out. But here's what we do know. You know, even, even if I make a, you know, a terrible blunder in my decision, you know, quit the one job, go to the other job, it disappears overnight. You know, what was that? Here's what we know. God is still able to cause all things to work together for good for those who love him and are called according to his purpose. Press ahead with the will of God. You know, don't be paralyzed by fear. But press ahead in the courage that the Holy Spirit gives us. And that's, that's why he says, I want you to know the will of God with spiritual wisdom and with spiritual understanding, able to, to, to sort of put things into context. And when you can't put them into context, let God put them into context for you. So he says, I'm, I'm desirous that you would know the will of God. Now, what is the result of that? Verse 10, so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord. I want you to know the will of God so your life will be worthy of Christ. Now, look, my life is not worthy of Christ. I've only been a Christian for the last uh, about a half century, a little better than a half century. And my life is not worthy of Christ. But by his grace, he has brought me into a fellowship with him, and I want to be worthy of that grace. I want to live in a way that's worthy of who he is. I don't always do it. You know, there's times, you know, I look at my life and I say, you know, it's not one step backwards, it forwards two steps back. It's one step forward and about a mile backwards, it seems sometimes. But I want you to know the will of God and have a focus on the will of God, Paul says, so that you might walk in a way worthy of the Lord. Now, that word walk, is a word. it, it just means live in a way worthy of the Lord. Um, Paul was a Hebrew. He thought in Hebrew categories. Uh, in the Hebrew language, the word for walk is halak. Um, uh, scholars think that it comes from the sound that shoes makes as they go kalak, 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 okay. I don't know, it, it, it might show up on an SAT test somewhere. <laughs> but uh, uh, the word was halak, and the rabbis, if you ask them, what is biblical interpretation, what does it mean to interpret the Bible, they would say it's halakha. It is how you walk. There are two kinds of interpretation, halakha and haggadah. Debbie memorized those, Halakha and Hagendas. <laughs> but uh, but Halakha was the interpretation of what does the Bible say? How do the scriptures say we should live, we should walk? And so when Paul says that you walk in a way worthy of Christ, he's saying that you live that way. That it, that it just works out in your daily journey, uh, that, that it works out that you are living in a way that is reflective of who Jesus Christ is. Not to earn his presence, but because he is gracious enough to be present in your life. See, it all has to do with that focus and that intentionality and, and where you're headed in life. Paul says, I want that, that, that the will of God would be at the very focus so that you would walk in a way worthy of Christ. And then here's the other results. Bearing fruit in every, uh, well, fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work, increasing in the knowledge of God. Don't you want those things? You know, what does it say? The first one, you know, pleasing to him just making God happy. All right, bearing fruit. We talked about that last week, the gospel bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. The more you know him, the more you want to serve him and be obedient to him. So, so Paul says, I'm praying that you would know the will of God so that you would walk in a way that would reflect who Jesus is, would glorify him, would bring him honor and praise, that would be worthy of him. And then in verse 12, he says, how, how are you going to, uh, ver verse 11, how are you going to do that? May you be strengthened with all power. Now, my translation has the next phrase as, according to his glorious might. If you were to look at the Greek text of that, it would say, according to the power of his glory. It's sort of a Semitic phrase that's taken into Greek. According to the power of his glory. Did you know the glory of God has power in your life? 
Have you ever been in a moment where the glory of God just broke out on top of you and, you had, and it was just so un, uh, unmistakable? It's like you're, you're sitting there and the, the glory of God was just coming down on you like a hard rainstorm and it felt wonderful. And in that moment, you thought to yourself, you know, here in the presence of the glory of God, I can do it. You know, here in the presence of God, I, I, I really can love people and I can forgive people and I, I really can serve and I can, really can be a steward and, and I really can't set aside all the ancient uh, bigotries and prejudices that have, that have accumulated around me. I really can be a new creation in Christ, surrounded by the glory of God that happens. That's why in this worship service, you know, when we're singing and, and the music is going, it, you know, it's not just an emotional experience. What we're doing is we're practicing for heaven and the glory of God comes down. Folks, I believe what worship is, it's the answer to the Lord's prayer when he says, thy kingdom come. It just rains down upon us. And in a worship service like this, you're saying to yourself, yeah, I can do that. Yeah, that can, that can work in my life. You see, there's power in the glory of God. The problem is we wake up on Monday morning and we forget the glory. And we forget that the God who is glorious in church is the God who's glorious in the car on the daily commute. He's the God who's glorious at work. He's the God who's glorious in the recreation fields. He's the God who is glorious in, in, in the classrooms. I mean, God has been showing me lately how much he is glorified by those who hate him. Did you know that? Because every time I read one of those foul-mouthed sort of trolls you know, on the Internet, Immediately, my mind goes to, they're just, they just don't know. They don't know how glorious. And I find myself giving glory to God because of what they wrote. Look, God doesn't want the trolls writing, you know, malicious stuff on the Internet. But when they do, he's going to use it for his glory. You know. Oh, I, I got lost there. Where am I? Okay. There's power in the glory of God. And so Paul says, I want you to know the will, walk in a way worthy by the power of the glory of God's grace. And that glory transforms you and, to and radically remakes you. And you live according to that glory of God. We'll, we'll look at the rest of this paragraph uh, uh, next week. But I just want to give you the last two words of verse 11 because uh, we need to move on. Verse 11, may you be strengthened with all power according to the, uh, his glorious might, in, according to uh, the, the power of his glory. For all endurance and patience, a lot we could say, but the last two words, with joy. With joy. See, when I think of Jesus, I don't think of someone who begrudgingly did the will of the Father. Okay, I got to go heal a leper. Fine, be healed. Happy Father. <laughs> now, I kind of feel like it was the joy of Christ to reach out and touch someone that nobody else would touch. And to bring a cleansing to their life and a radical transformation to every venue of, of, of their existence. I kind of feel like it was the joy of Jesus Christ to be in, interrupted by little short men up in trees. I think it, it was his joy to be stopped by somebody uh, calling out from the back of the crowd, Jesus, Son of David, have mercy on me. I think it was kind of his joy to go into Jerusalem and there to stand in the glory of the Father and give his life for a lost humanity. I think the joy of Jesus' heart is the will of the Father. And when we know him, it's our joy as well. It's not a burdensome thing. It's, it's not as though God is out to make us sorrowful and, and, and miserable. We, we do the will of the Father with joy. Because our example is Jesus, not the rest of humanity. Let me, let me close with one other scene from the life of Christ. Right after the resurrection, um, for some reason, Peter said to the other disciples, he said, let's go fishing. You remember that? He said, let's go fishing. The other disciples said, okay, we'll go fishing. After all, it's not what you catch, it's just the fellowship you enjoy. I don't fish, but I know you're supposed to say that. <laughs> So uh, they, they go fishing, they don't catch anything, but they have wonderful fellowship. And uh, uh, then Jesus on the beach says, you know, you, you haven't caught anything. Here, try the other side of the boat. They catch fish, they bring it in. Jesus fixes breakfast, they have breakfast and all that. Okay. After all that's done, Jesus is talking to Simon Peter. And he says, Peter, do you love me? Three times, do you love me, do you love me, do you love me? Peter says, I love you, I love you. Hey, why do you keep asking? 
And Jesus said to Peter this. He said, Peter, when you were young, you would dress yourself and you'd go anywhere you wanted. But when you're old, you're going to put out your hands. Someone else will dress you, and they will take you wherever they want. And the Scripture says that Jesus said this to signify by what means Peter would die. That Peter would die the martyr's death. This is God's will for Peter's life, that he die the martyr's death. Well, Peter does exactly what you and I would do. He looks around and says, John, what about him? What about John? You know, if I have to die, what about him? And Jesus said to Peter, he said, what is that to you? He said, if I want him to remain until I come again, what is that to you? And then these two words that Jesus said to Peter, follow me. He said, Peter, it's not about whether you like it or not. It's not about whether John gets a better deal or not. It's not about anybody but between you and me, Peter, follow me. Just follow me. And I'm praying that you would know the will of God in your life, that you would follow in the footsteps of Christ so closely that your life would glorify the Father in a way that is worthy of Jesus Christ. And here's why. It will give you clarity in a murky world. With all the things the world is saying you need, all the things our culture is talking about have to be a part of your life, all the things that society is saying has, has, has to be incorporated into in what you do and believe, if you are focused on Jesus Christ, if you are focused on the will of God, it will give you clarity that you're going to need as you live for Christ. Let's bow for, for prayer. And Father, I'm so thankful and grateful that it's by grace and not our works. It's because you love us, not because of the strength of our love for you. Father, I'm thankful for the gift of your Holy Spirit make, that makes all this possible and works all this out. And so I would ask this morning that your Holy Spirit would be poured down on your people, that that person here today who does not know Christ would come to accept him, that brother and sister who has lived in a way departing from Christ would come back to him, but, Father, that all of us would just love him more and follow him more closely, and that he alone would reign in our lives. Father, I ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen.